A hundred of these companies create 70% of our, of our global emissions. Wouldn't it be better to hold our noses, to not villainize them, to understand that no industry is ever going to cut its own throat and take away its profits? How do we bribe them? Bribe them. Bribe them. Bribe them. Bribe them. Bribe them. So I work in the nonprofit sector. I won't say where or in what field, but I was recently at a workshop training for people who work to finance environmental, public health, and developmental projects. The people attending this workshop, all from the public sector, come to learn how they can induce investment from the private sector. And they use all types of different tools to encourage the private sector to invest. Things like guaranteeing the risk on investment, where if the investment into a public project goes bad, the public sector, whether it's a government, a nonprofit, a public fund, or whatever it may be, pays the private sector out of pocket to cover them for the loss. So that's what it takes in some cases, literally zero risk investments for private financiers. And this is the basic operating procedure of the nonprofit industry. Everything about the sector is built around the profit motive of financiers. Now, that may come as a shock to some of you. You may be thinking, well, don't nonprofits get their money from donations? And that's true. Donations are what keep the lights on. They pay salary and in some cases are used towards specific projects. But what you must understand is that nonprofits are taking on challenges the size of which are better suited for sovereign budgets rather than wealthy individuals or disparate organizations. The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation finds that an additional $370 billion is needed annually for public health initiatives in developing nations over what the public sector currently is channeling. Various nonprofits have estimated that somewhere between an additional $600 to $800 billion is required annually to adequately conserve the planet's biodiversity. And you can get these kinds of numbers for any of the other many worthy causes out there, universal housing, universal education, etc. So we're talking about annual shortfalls in the trillions of dollars for funding important social, economic, and environmental causes around the globe. And keep in mind, we're trillions of dollars short compared to what we're already investing. It's not like we need trillions of dollars and we're already 95% of the way there. To conserve the planet's biodiversity, we're not even a fifth of the way there. And because we're falling so woefully short of these financing goals, the nonprofit sector is left no choice but to engage with the private sector, where the vast majority of the globe's wealth is held. And for anyone getting discouraged or intimidated by the size of these numbers, I must stress that the money to avoid ecological collapse and global pestilence does exist. The United States and China alone, two of the biggest polluting nations on the planet, rake in a combined $40 trillion per year in gross domestic product. We can fund global health, prosperity, and environmental protection, but institutions around the globe are simply choosing not to. And so, if wealthy and powerful institutions of the world, governments, corporations, and international organizations like the United Nations or International Monetary Fund, are broadly unable or unwilling to mobilize the necessary resources to combat the challenges facing our planet, then it would seem that there is a systemic failure to address these problems. And today, I will be arguing that this is intentional, that the global philanthropic system is designed to undermine the political will for structural change in favor of cheap and ineffective capitalist alternatives. As a disclaimer, however, I will be talking about this from a United States perspective, since I am a US citizen, but of course, that is not the end-all be-all to this issue. So let's dive back into this training I attended. At the start, the training began with an explicit argument for what was called conscious capitalism, as in capitalism that is aware of the socioeconomic challenges of our time and adapts what it chooses to fund accordingly. And let me be clear, this was not some detour in the conversation. There was a PowerPoint slide devoted to this topic. It was part of the course. So let's give it some consideration. The idea of conscious capitalism is that within a marketplace filled with billions of people, all of which acting on their own individual selfish impulses, if every single person just decided to recalibrate how selfish they want to be, 
It would fix climate change, and food insecurity, and homelessness, and everything in between. But capitalism is an economic doctrine that explicitly argues for selfishness and individuality. These are the core mechanisms that organize free markets. It is central to capitalist economic theory. These are not bugs, they are features. Yet to fix it, we're simply going to ask everyone to stop thinking so selfishly and individualistically? The notion that conscious capitalism could safeguard against the worst tendencies of this economic system, while the profit motive of the actors operating within it remains fixed in place, is blatantly contradictory. And let me say that my peers at this workshop are intelligent people, more than capable of critical thinking and analysis. Yet the workshop in which they're being instructed is based on an obviously flawed premise. There was no analysis of the state of the world's challenges, the lack of funding, and the structural roots of this shortfall. No, this analysis assumes first that capitalism must remain intact. Everything else is reverse engineered from there. The solution was decided before even looking at the problem. So all these non-profit practitioners, these people who earnestly want to change the planet in a positive way, are willing to do so, but not outside the paradigm of capitalism. The status quo, the profit motive, all of this must remain untouched, according to this training. Capitalism is unquestionably good, the problem is simply people making bad decisions within it, and if all those people start doing the right thing, everything will just kind of fix itself. But this is not serious thinking. This is not thinking that is interested in addressing the roots of the challenges we face as nonprofit employees. It is fairy tale nonsense. It takes as a given that the status quo must remain unchanged and then blames regular people making everyday decisions according to their structural incentives as the reason for the status quo's problems. If any of my peers at this training were skeptical of this notion, they certainly did not voice any concerns. I've already mentioned the challenge that the public sector faces of getting enough funding to combat systemic problems on a global scale, and all the people in this training with me are well aware of those challenges too. It's the very reason that they came to this workshop. And yet, nobody will say the quiet part aloud, that as long as we continue to allow capitalism to decide what is and is not worthy of funding, everything we do as nonprofit employees is just an elaborate charade. And that's the core issue here. When you really get down to it, most of the people who fill out the public sector are committed to capitalism first and the actual mission of their nonprofit second. The planet is being incinerated, it poses an existential threat to everyone living on it, and yet the people tasked with fixing it have decided their allegiance lies not with the planet, but with the incinerator. After this lionization of conscious capitalism, my peers and I get to work talking about what we can do for these financiers. How much money can we earn some Wall Street type for investing in a small rural African village? Can we make one of these big banks or institutions enough money to believe that disadvantaged people are worth investing in? That their environments and livelihoods and public health matter? And that's what we do all day in the nonprofit sector figure out how to bribe people who already have too much to care about the trials of people with too little. Not only is this a soulless task, but it's a futile one as well. The instructor of the training, who shall remain nameless, admits himself that for every 100 deals, deals as they're called, people with their environments and health and livelihoods all laid at the mercy of these wealthy investors and institutions, for every 100 deals that an investor could choose to invest in, about one to three of them will end up getting some sort of funding. The instructor of the course gave that estimate himself. And keep in mind that this is his idea of conscious capitalism. This is his idea of capitalism when it's working. Because these investors that nonprofits work with are supposedly accounting for the value of the public good in these projects when choosing to invest. When these nonprofit employees present their plans, let me tell you, they have been thorough. Because of how high the bar is set by the private sector to get any type of funding, years of work is done in advance before proposing these projects. Investors are given information on the action plan and what outcomes can be expected, whether it's the amount of livelihood supported, the amount of land under conservation, etc. The concept development takes years of tedious and hard work. 
time, effort, and money that should be spent on taking action today is spent asking capitalists to maybe take action tomorrow. And after all this work, even through the lens of a conscious capitalist, as they're called, 97 to 99% of programs meant to address global challenges and support underprivileged people are still not deemed worthy of funding. We're talking about helping people without clean drinking water or electricity, protecting habitats being destroyed in the Amazon or the Congo, providing food and education for starving children. But investors don't see that. Capitalism doesn't see that. These lives, these ecosystems, they're all statistics in an Excel sheet telling investors whether they can turn a fast buck or not. And at market rate, too. Because these investors are not comparing these projects to one in which they make no money. They're comparing these projects to what they'd earn if they invested at the standard market rate. It's not even like they're saying, oh, instead of an 8% return annually, you can give us 4% or a 2% return. No, it's gotta be 8 it's got to be market rate or higher. Either compete with the investment returns of multinational corporations or stop wasting my time. And so, of course, out of 100 possible deals, only one or two are going to end up being profitable and large scale enough to be worthy of financing by these standards. And the other 98% are the small communities that just don't have the resources nor the opportunities to compete. I can't, for the life of me, understand how anyone can take a look at this system and judge that things are going fine. And this is starting to sound like a condemnation of my colleagues and peers. Like, how could people who are so well-educated and well-meaning not acknowledge the plainly obvious flaws in this theory of change? Surely it must be something sinister. They must all be plants of the capitalist system, colluding to undermine better alternatives. But to be absolutely clear, this is not what I'm saying. The instructor honestly seemed like a really great guy, despite my ideological disagreements with him. And my peers at this workshop were all truly wonderful people that really do give a damn about the work that they're doing. After all, they each have dedicated their lives to work toward positive change. But unfortunately for all of us in the room, myself included, We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceived I'll give you another example. There was a woman who presented at this training, and I'm leaving this intentionally vague, but she was supporting small communities in low-income countries getting renewable electricity. And one of the aspects she mentioned was that her team could support people in acquiring cook stoves for their homes. By virtue of having a cook stove, you'd reduce smoke affecting public health, you'd have less deforestation from gathering firewood, and crucially, you'd have more energy efficiency since cook stoves are far more effective at heating a pan than an open flame in terms of energy capture. It was a cool project with a lot of value for creating sustainable livelihoods. And the woman presenting said, quote, we're thinking about pursuing carbon credits for this. Now, if you don't know, carbon credits are when you have a project that promises to reduce X amount of metric tons of carbon through some intervention. In this case, it's the amount of carbon that could be saved by using cook stoves when compared to an open flame. The difference in expected carbon emissions between these two options is what's known as the carbon credit, since it is an anticipated reduction in global CO2 emissions. And so what you'll do is you'll take this carbon credit to a carbon market. Now in many countries, though probably not all, companies are required to cap their carbon emissions. The government says, for a business of your size in this industry, you're only allowed to pollute Y amount this year if we all plan to stay on track with our climate goals. But many of these companies don't actually fulfill those commitments. Shocking, I know. So what they'll do is they go to a carbon market to buy a carbon credit, essentially paying for the government to look the other way. The company will say, yeah, I polluted too much but I also supported this project that reduced emissions, so it's kind of like I didn't pollute at all, when you think about it. Whenever you hear the term net zero emissions, or carbon offsets, this is what they're talking about. Doing a little good to make up for a little bad. And it almost sounds like this could work, except it absolutely doesn't, and for a few reasons. The first reason is that calculating how much carbon is saved is an art, not a science. You're trying to measure the absence of matter, but how can you really know for sure? For example, these are often applied to tree planting projects. 
but how do you know how much carbon each tree is going to collect? Do you watch the CO2 molecules that get absorbed by the leaves and meticulously count each one? No, you don't. You take a guess. And these guesses can be better or worse, but the point is there's no solid scientific foundation for any of the carbon credits that are traded in carbon markets. Everyone is just going by what feels right. The second reason is how much is a metric ton of carbon worth? Who sets the price? What's the point of comparison? We know that tens of billions of metric tons of CO2 are emitted each year. And we know the cumulative effects of that will be disastrous and cost many lives and trillions of dollars to the global economy. But that's all the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. But what about any random sample of carbon that gets categorized as a carbon credit? How much of this presupposed damage will this one carbon credit spare us from? It's impossible to say. Does that concern advocates of carbon markets? No, silly, because our lord and savior, the invisible hand, will set the price of the carbon in the market. And that price is at the intersection of how little the corporation buying the credit wants to pay and how much the seller wants to charge. That's it. It is literally completely uncorrelated with any actual expected value of the carbon being saved. It's just what the people in the market tell themselves that's worth. And if you're thinking, well, this sounds like a flawed system, but at least it's still funding some reduction in carbon emissions, think again. Because the third reason why carbon credits don't work is because they aren't sold in a vacuum. Take the example of cook stoves, for instance. A study of a similar project in India where cookstoves were used to sell carbon credits showed that none of the anticipated carbon savings actually happened. Why? Because when women in India didn't have to go through the trouble of starting a fire every time that they wanted to cook, cooking became more accessible. It became an easy and even fun thing to do, so women started cooking more, offsetting the expected reduction in CO2. There was a behavior change that wasn't accounted for, and it rendered the carbon credits essentially null and void. But the credits had already been sold, the money had already been invested into the cook stoves, and the companies who bought the credits had already written off their emissions for the year, and yet, no emissions were actually reduced. This same thing also happens when wildfires suddenly rip through a forest that had been registered for carbon credits. All the emissions go up in smoke, literally, but the companies still get to keep their net zero image. It is the ultimate greenwashing tool, which also makes it the preferred investment of large corporations and wealthy investors. If you want to learn more about how carbon credits are a scam, Climate Town did a really good video on them which you can check out in the links below. Going back to the workshop, this is what I said to the presenter. I said, I'm a carbon market skeptic, and I don't recommend you pursue that route. And if you do, at least be conscientious about how you report the carbon reductions so that way the results will have integrity. And she responded, and I quote, I understand your concerns, but there's a lot of money in the carbon market. Discussion over. And who could blame her? Because I'm sitting in an air-conditioned office that's fully electrified with a laptop and internet. They even have little snacks and coffee laid out for us. And all the way across the world where she's working, there are people who are living without electricity and running water and starting fires to cook their food every single day. So what can you do if you're her? You say, okay, so those people don't get electricity. These people don't get power because it offends your white American sensibilities. No, of course not. If a corporation comes around and says, I'm going to heavily fund your project for the public good, and all you have to do is give me some cover as a polluter, who wouldn't take that? And think of what happens once the negotiation for the carbon credit starts. Are you going to tell the buyer how much carbon you actually expect to save and sell at a lower price? Or are you going to embellish the expected results a little so that you can get the money you actually need? And that's why I bear no ill will towards my peers. There's nothing sinister about trying to get results for the deserving people on whose behalf you work. The sinister part is baked right into the system itself. All of this, the whole nonprofit charade, boils down to the fact that there are entire nations of people who desperately need resources, and to get them, they must beg and plead with those at the top for a fraction of what they own. My peers are good people, and they really care about getting their counterparts the things they deserve, but to do so, you must make a deal with the devil. It is the name of the game. 
And trust me when I tell you that making a deal with the devil was the way the instructor of the training actually phrased this aspect of financing. Even the guy who makes full-throated appeals to conscious capitalism still sees how absolutely slimy this Faustian bargain is. And from a selfish point of view, we all have bills to pay too. For myself as well as my peers, this is the thing we went to college to do. Educating ourselves and dedicating our lives to public service was something we were encouraged to do while growing up. And now, we're all saddled with student debt from the education we needed to break into the sector, partaking in a system that actively works against our efforts to promote the public good. But what are we supposed to do? Become despondent, quit our jobs, and live on the streets in self-righteous poverty like Diogenes? Who does that help? And that's the truly monstrous part of capitalism that it takes the best intentions of good people and preys on them for its own gain. And so we remain motivated, just like everyone else in society, to keep our heads down, keep marching forward, and keep waiting for our turn to feed the greedy, bottomless incinerator once more. That's why nonprofits operating as agents within a capitalist system cannot possibly be the solution to the problems created by that same system. It's not to say they shouldn't exist at all, it's great that private individuals can use philanthropy as a means of supporting the causes that are important to them. It's just that they need to exist as a supplement to addressing socioeconomic and environmental crises, not as the primary tool. To address systemic issues, we will need systemic solutions. And this is simply due to the nature of what are known in economics as public goods and common resources. Both public goods and common resources are defined as items that are non-excludable, meaning you cannot prevent any given person from using them. In either case, everyone benefits from having access to both sets of these goods. However, the cost of these goods to maintain can be extremely high. Roads are expensive to build, and maintaining clean air and fresh water requires society-wide communication, planning, and commitment. It simply makes more sense for us to agree on how to address these issues democratically and then diffuse the cost across the population via taxes. In other words, these are not things that private individuals can or should be bearing the cost of providing, and that's for a few reasons. The first reason is that the cost of protecting ecosystems, establishing energy grids, building hospitals, or whatever it may be, will likely be prohibitively high for individuals and institutions. However, the utility a community will get from these things will be much greater than the cost itself. So when viewed through a utilitarian lens, the investment into public goods and common resources are well worth it. But when it comes to the cost-benefit analysis of a single individual, these things may not be worth paying for. After all, why should I spend all the money building a hospital when the utility will be enjoyed by mostly everyone other than me? This is why only 1-3% to of deals presented by nonprofits get funding from private actors. The public good can only ever be so profitable for any given individual. Under our current status quo, this calculus has been the reason why we have generally neglected to make large-scale public investments. And so, it's left up to the public sector to try to convince wealthy individuals and institutions that these projects are worthwhile from a profit motive standpoint. As grotesque as it may be, it's a last-ditch attempt by nonprofits to mobilize resources for desperate people by speaking the language of capitalists. Under our current paradigm, this is the most effective way to do so, by which I mean the only way to do so. And I commend my peers for doing the best they can with what they have, but the mistake they make is forgetting that these systemic conditions are not natural law. They are the result of political choices made by people. We invented them, we can change them. That's why a supposedly apolitical workshop needs to begin with a case for conscious capitalism. The rest of the training about how to properly beg rich people for their scraps only makes sense when one assumes capitalism to be a fixed variable. Nothing captures this more succinctly than the notion that 97-99% to 99 of the projects that nonprofits propose to the private sector will receive any funding. Yet for every single one of those projects, months to years of due diligence was done. Time was taken to go to the field, schedule interviews with experts, meet with stakeholders to present the concept and receive feedback. This iteration process repeats itself again and again and again until the proposal is deemed worthy of being presented to a potential financier. Oh, and the consultants. My god, the consultants. 
Since nonprofits try to minimize their overhead costs, so maximum funding goes toward projects, they often don't invest in having their own in-house capacity. But what this means is that they eventually have to spend far more money hiring a consultant from McKinsey or Deloitte to do the proposal work rather than if they just had their own internal hire. When you're waiting on McKinsey to help save the world, it might be time to go back to the drawing board. So overall, we're talking about thousands to tens of thousands of hours of manpower. Hundreds of thousands to millions of philanthropic dollars spent laying the groundwork for investment. Entire communities of people across the globe hoping and praying that the time they've spent supporting a proposal's development will be fruitful and that they'll get the funding they need. All of this only for it to be shrugged off by some half-interested finance type five minutes into a presentation because it won't make as much as writing a loan to BP Oil again. Meanwhile, in the time it took to develop the presentation, the poor continued to languish, children continued to starve and go uneducated, and tons of pollution pours into the water we drink and the air we breathe every single day. Would it not have been more effective to have committed to large-scale government action up front so that all that time, money, and effort instead could have been spent implementing programs for the public good rather than spending it all just to get a foot in the door with some overpaid and underqualified gatekeeper at a finance institution? Of course. Especially once you consider that a government wouldn't skim an additional 8% return off the top each year like private investors do. So why don't we do it that way? Well, think of the process I've just described above. Who gets paid and who gets final authority? The capitalists. The consultants doing the work and the investors making the decisions. This is why we do it this way. The philanthropic system is not about solving the complex problems facing the public. It is about ensuring that capitalists still get the final word on how society's resources are used, which is always to enrich themselves. Now recall that this was the base assumption that conscious capitalism began with. Everything else was reverse engineered after, which segues into the final reason why the system fails. It is wildly anti-democratic. We are talking about a system in which the decision of whether poor communities across the globe get necessary infrastructure is decided by unelected and unaffected wealthy individuals and executives living on the opposite side of the world. Why should a handful of people sitting in private offices in Washington, D.C., New York, San Francisco, Paris, Brussels, or London get to decide whether someone else's community is worth investing in? Fox did a nice video on this that I suggest you check out. The link will be down there. So if this system was designed to promote efficiency in how we create more sustainable and prosperous communities around the world, then it's not doing a very good job in any regard. And if this system is not in place based on its own merit, then its preservation only makes sense once you realize that helping people isn't the point. The point is to uphold the capitalist hierarchy. We know that many of the problems that nonprofits fight are byproducts of the capitalist system environmental destruction, public health crises, wealth inequality, etc. And so if it's this system that's creating these problems, then why don't nonprofits speak out against it? And it's for a couple of reasons. The first is that it's codified into law that 501c3 nonprofits in the United States, the ones that are designated as working toward a social cause, cannot lobby the government. Earlier in this video, I critiqued my peers for not speaking out more broadly about the contradiction of using capitalism to fix capitalism, which they can and should be doing. But a nonprofit as an institution cannot legally mobilize its resources to challenge the capitalist status quo. The second reason is due to mission drift, which is defined as a discontinuity between a nonprofit's actions and its stated social mission. So how does this happen? Well, Think of if you founded a nonprofit yourself. You'd probably start out with a righteous mission statement and some big aspirations. But over time, you realize that compromises need to be made in order to keep the lights on. Certain priorities need to be rearranged in order to align with donors and investors in your program. For example, we have seen in the case of my peer who was establishing energy grids how easily the allure of large-scale funding from carbon credits can enable widespread corporate greenwashing. Slowly, the integrity of the nonprofit's operations begin to erode. Results regarding the impact you are creating for the people you are serving become overpromised and underdelivered. This is a natural reaction to having to work for a private funder who makes funding conditional on high impact results. 
Because what are you going to do? Abandon a community you've been working with on a good cause because some rich guy told you it wasn't impactful enough? No. If people only get money to deliver high impact results, you don't actually get better results. You just get a lot of people lying for money. It's a system that rewards self-aggrandizing and self-promoting behavior rather than efficacy. This is something I've had personal experience with. I once worked on a project where a billionaire had donated several million dollars to my organization to make a for-profit investment into a company. However, when my colleagues and I started to do the research of the kind of impact this investment could be expected to deliver, the case became rather vague. But the billionaire got impatient with all of our due diligence and demanded his funds were invested as he had asked. And since the organization had money in hand and didn't want to risk their relationship to him, they gave the project the green light in a matter of months without even a slight idea of how it would serve their overall mission. And keep in mind, this was a for-profit investment. So it's a money-making opportunity for a billionaire with questionable impact beyond that. And my organization went along with it. It begs the question, what's the difference between a non-profit and an investment fund at that point? And that's how you get mission drift. Since nonprofits are established in the beginning with a righteous cause, they eventually perceive their continued existence as also being righteous. A belief spreads that what's good for the nonprofit is what's good for the mission. If certain things must be done in order to acquire funding, then the means always justify the ends. But after a certain point, nonprofits become so compromised by selling themselves out to corporations and the ultra wealthy to keep the lights on that their original purpose is lost on them entirely. After all, if you were successful as a nonprofit in achieving your mission, you'd also have successfully put yourself out of business. And finally, there's the selfish motive for quietly enabling the status quo. As I mentioned earlier, nonprofit employees need to pay their bills, and this influence is much more acute for the executives of these organizations. There is no shortage of big events and lavish galas that these nonprofit executives attend in order to rub shoulders with the world's kingmakers. And since so much of a nonprofit's success depends on maintaining these kinds of relationships, it's not the place to start mouthing off about systemic failures. With their high levels of visibility among the public, connections to the ultra-wealthy, executive paychecks, and influence in global decision-making, nonprofit executives themselves become members of the ruling class. This undoubtedly relaxes their urgency to combat systemic injustices, even those affecting the causes that they supposedly champion. And it would be bad enough if nonprofits were simply turning a blind eye towards the systemic problems that they're supposed to be fixing, but it doesn't stop there. Rather, the philanthropic system is used by the ultra wealthy as a means to evade taxes, launder their public personas, and undermine capitalist reforms. How is this possible? Well, the linchpin of the entire operation is that to the average person, nonprofits and philanthropy are unquestionably good things. And wouldn't it be nice to live in a country where one could just assume that to be true? But as we've seen, nonprofits are corrupted by the structures under which they operate. Beneath that gleaming facade of can do altruism lies the dark underbelly of the role nonprofits play in our system. To make the public feel as though things are being done to address systemic issues while never actually mobilizing the necessary resources to combat them. Take the issue of climate change, for example. We know that climate change is going to result in hundreds of millions of potentially a billion displaced people by the end of the century. We know many people will perish from drought, famine, flooding, hurricanes, and more. We know that when infrastructure is destroyed and storm surges or becomes totally submerged, it's difficult to use productively. We also know people are far less productive when they're climate refugees or starving or dead. The fact that climate change will cost the globe trillions of dollars in economic output by the end of the century is easily verified by simply considering these previous statements. And it has been further verified by decades of scientific data, as well as people's personal first-hand experience living through climate change's present day effects. This is a system that is unequivocally producing bad results. And I'm not even talking about all the death and suffering. From a purely economic and monetary standpoint, the only measure most capitalists care about, capitalism is failing to deliver the long-term prosperity that it's promised. And so, if you have a system that only results in net negative outcomes, 
then what is the defense for keeping it? And the answer lies in that key word, net. Because if a system only produced negative results 100% of the time, if the results were absolutely negative, people would demand that system change. But capitalism doesn't just destroy the planet while simultaneously giving miners black lung, it also creates good paying jobs for some people, and creates wealth for some people, and allows us to give our hard earned money to cool philanthropic projects which also may not actually do it. So yes, the world may be burning and labor may be overworked and underpaid, and overall the short-term profits will pale in comparison to the enormous costs of climate change, but why focus on the overwhelmingly negative effects when you can focus on marginally positive things instead? And this is a clever trick that capitalists have used for centuries in various aspects of society. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine that starts with buttering a slice of toast and ends by pushing a cancer patient out of a hospital for being uninsured. Overall, the outcomes are terrible, but the toast thing was pretty cool, huh? It's a slate of hand trick, no different than a street pickpocket asking you to look at your watch while they steal your wallet. A perfect illustration of this dynamic in the nonprofit world is the existence of philanthropic foundations. Take the Pew Charitable Trusts or Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies as examples. Both foundations have given millions of dollars to nonprofits in support of environmental action. But who founded these generous organizations? None other than the heirs to the Sunoco and Cargill family fortunes, two of the largest global polluters on the planet. Beyond their emissions, Sunoco is known for spilling more crude oil into habitats than any of its competitors, and also for supporting the Dakota Access Pipeline, which raised environmental justice concerns by running through the native lands of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Cargill, for its part, is known as the largest privately owned company in America. It has a stranglehold on the agricultural sector, where it sells inputs like seeds and farming equipment at near monopoly prices, and then buys back the outputs like livestock and crops for dirt cheap since they're the only game in town. This egregious squeezing of farmers' margins has kept rural Americans in cycles of debt and poverty while the Cargill family laughs all the way to the bank. For more than a century, both companies have made tens of billions of dollars off the exploitation of people in nature. But don't worry, because they kick back a fraction of that money through their respective foundations to show how much they care afterwards. Tax and regulate our companies so that they pay their fair share to their workers and the government? Nonsense. That'll just prevent us from funding our precious philanthropic pursuits. And once the donation is sent out is when the real purpose of nonprofits take place. Public relations. Anytime a billionaire or giant corporation gives a grant or, hell, even a for-profit investment into a nonprofit's activities, a shameless display of glad-handing and self-congratulation follows. Nonprofits will make video packages, send out press releases, and do interviews wherein they thank their wealthy individual and corporate donors for all the good they're doing. For example, Jeff Bezos, notably one of the world's richest men and stingiest donors, recently gave several billion dollars of his fortune away in the form of 40 grants totaling $123 million each. This received much praise in news outlets, but recall earlier the process I mentioned for developing projects in the nonprofit world. Things take a long time. There's a lot of deliberation and consensus building among stakeholders about what can and should happen. These things require intense planning not only for the intervention itself, but for the monitoring process intended to evaluate the results afterwards. I know I just finished criticizing foundations, but at least they know to work with nonprofits to maneuver this process and crucially measure the impact that they're actually making. When a foundation writes a grant, it's for a specific measurable purpose. The philanthropic system may be broken as a whole, but at least foundations and other public agencies adhere to the system that is in place. Jeffrey, on the other hand, just simply wrote 40 checks and handed them out. There was no ideation behind what the money would go toward or what results would come of it because Jeffrey didn't care to think that hard about it. It doesn't matter to him that the money will likely be idling in some nonprofit's bank account until they can figure out what they're going to do with it because he got the press he wanted. Jeff Bezos is a good guy now. He didn't donate to any causes. He simply bought good publicity. More than that, 
He brought outsized influence into the decision making of some of the largest nonprofit organizations on the planet, something I stressed earlier as being immensely anti democratic. And you may be thinking to yourself, how can you possibly be upset about a person donating billions of dollars to charity, even if it could have been done better? And my answer to that is this donation is not even close to the amount of money Jeffrey would have given toward the public good compared to if he simply paid a fair wage to his workers and taxes to the government. As of the end of October 2021, of the 400 billionaires represented on the Forbes 400 list, a record high 156 billionaires had given away less than 1% of their wealth, Jeff Bezos included. In fairness to Jeff, this was before the donations that he made in 2022, so he may have cracked that 1% mark by now. The most generous 19 billionaires of that list of 400 had given 10% or more of their wealth away. So, by the standards of the richest class of people in the entire world, giving 10% of your wealth back to society amounts to being something like Mother Teresa. But while that may be the public persona these people are carefully crafting, I must remind you that billionaires should be paying 37% of their income in taxes and between 20-37% to 37 on capital gains. And that's in the United States, too, which has one of the lowest tax-to-GDP ratios of all OECD countries. So even by the standards of a country with a relatively lax tax system, even the most generous billionaires are still not contributing to society nearly at the rate that they should be. That's because, as mentioned earlier, the philanthropic system exists to make people feel like things are being done to combat social issues, while not actually coming close to doing so. And this illusion makes government action on social issues seem redundant, and therefore the taxation needed to deal with it. As the thinking goes, if I'm already donating to the Salvation Army, then what do I need government welfare programs for? It creates a scenario in which supporting the basic needs of people becomes voluntary, rather than a mandatory civic duty of society. Moreover, donating can placate people from wanting to take further action. Volunteer my time or participate in direct action? Psh, I just gave $20 to the Red Cross, what more do you people want from me? So large corporations and their executives create the conditions for society's hardships, then evade paying the taxes that would go toward fixing said hardships, then give a comparatively small donation and get held up as heroes. This is what the American philanthropic system is designed to do. It enables the root causes of injustice in our capitalist system, undermines the political resources for reform, and glorifies the people who create those injustices for their own profit. What's more, Philanthropy is a virtue, whereas taxes are just what's expected. Nobody ever threw a big gala to celebrate all the people who paid their taxes on time. Oh, and did I forget to mention that all these charitable donations are tax deductible in the United States? Regarding our pal Jeffrey, for every $1 billion that he donates, he will be eligible for $390 million in tax deductions. That means for 39% of his donation, he functionally isn't giving a single penny but rather directing the government on where to spend its money. So not only is high-profile philanthropy from wealthy individuals and institutions ineffective, self-serving, and a distraction from real solutions, but it also makes the contributions of the wealthy to the public good voluntary rather than paid through taxation. It is an intricate means of stabilizing capitalism, even as it destroys our communities, while giving great PR to the ones doing all the damage. All the wealthy have to do is give a pithy sum to a personal pet cause every once in a while, and that's it. But despite how cushy of a deal this is, billionaires like Elon Musk are still dissatisfied with having to part with even paltry amounts of their fortunes. Musk is also one of those 156 billionaires on the Forbes 400 list giving away less than 1% of their wealth that I mentioned earlier. In an interview with Business Insider in May 2022, Musk said, quote, when it comes to donations, I'd say it is very difficult to give away money effectively. And if you care about the reality of doing good and not the perception of doing good, he continues, then it is very hard to give away money effectively. I care about reality, perception be damned. Now this was something we touched on with Bezos signing over 40 checks of more than $100 million. Under our current system, it is indeed difficult to give away money effectively. Unless the public sector receives notice in advance, there doesn't exist the capacity to disperse resources to those who need them at a moment's notice. 
These things require planning to put the right people and systems in place before the money arrives. But Musk is using this as an argument against giving money away, when in reality, this is an argument against the status quo that has given him such exorbitant wealth in the first place. What do I mean by this? Well, let me present two alternative realities that may be more effective at providing for the public good. In the first, imagine a reality in which the United States invested in big tax and spend programs. This reality would be fairly like our own in the sense that the same capitalist system still exists. Capitalists are still crushing unions and suppressing wages and taking home outsized profits. You're still subject to the petty tyrannies of middle managers and the like. The only difference is that after the corporations and ultra-wealthy have made their profits, the government would step in and say, you need to redistribute enough of this wealth to meet the basic needs of our citizens and your workers. In that case, people like Musk and Bezos would be taxed at levels much higher than under our current paradigm, under which they often don't pay any tax at all. Yes, they'd still be billionaires and have enormous influence in society, but they would be reined in, to an extent. So that's alternate reality number one. Alternate reality number two is very different from our current system. In this system, the government aggressively pursues antitrust policy and breaks up monopolies and oligopolies across every industry in the nation. Simultaneously, they would empower unions, small business owners, and cooperatively owned business. This would be a society in which workers would mostly own the means of production. We'd see wages catch up to productivity as the wealth created by labor was returned back into the pockets of workers. Since wages have gone up, people would be able to provide for their own basic needs. Schools, hospitals, and infrastructure could be maintained by prosperous local communities. Some large-scale government programs may still be necessary for things like climate initiatives, but the overall strain on things like the welfare state would be significantly reduced. With more money back in the hands of workers and communities, fewer taxes are required to redistribute wealth and fund people's basic needs. The poorest people have enough, and the richest people are the heads of medium-sized corporations and have fortunes in the hundreds of millions rather than the hundreds of billions. Okay, so that's alternate reality number two. Now let's think about the role of philanthropy in both of these alternate realities, relative to our current system. In reality one, philanthropy could still exist, but it would be as a supplement to big government. However, these government programs would be more effective than our current philanthropic system, since they would be fully funded at the start, have a prescribed plan of action, and systems would be kept in place so that any time more money came in, it just as quickly could be put towards productive ends. However, this reality still leaves the underlying capitalist system unchallenged. It just simply redistributes wealth after the fact to mitigate its most harmful effects. Corporations could still crush wages and pollute, but the government would step in to fix things after the fact. So now let's compare with the second alternate reality. In this case, philanthropy just isn't as necessary. Most people are no longer poor because they are paid properly for the value they produce. Nobody is missing good schools or hospitals because local taxes among prosperous local communities should be able to afford it. And this is the most effective way that anybody can possibly distribute money for a couple of reasons. For one, it's fair. If you work a job, you should get compensated properly for that job. The second reason is because it is democratic. Regular people with money in their hands know how to spend it in a way that improves their lives better than every politician, government bureaucrat, billionaire, and nonprofit executive combined. And thirdly, it emphasizes positive change on a small scale. It's easier to effectively manage and finance projects for the public good at a community level. There's less money to raise, less bureaucracy, fewer activities to be implemented, fewer people to coordinate, etc. This is much faster and simpler than developing a single large-scale federal initiative that needs to account for all the people and places it will affect. It takes the power of spending for the public good out of the hands of businesses, nonprofits, and the federal government and puts it directly in the hands of the people who created the wealth in the first place. And this brings us all back to our friend Elon Musk. If Mr. Musk was genuinely concerned with how hard it is to give away money effectively, perhaps he'd want to argue for one of the structural changes to the system that I've listed here. But does Elon actually want either of these alternate realities to come to fruition? Of course not. He certainly doesn't want to be taxed more, and he would sooner die before paying his workers a fair share of company profits. So when he complains that giving money away is difficult, 
He's not saying that we should work toward a world in which money can be given to the public good as effectively as possible. He's simply saying that he shouldn't be pressured into donating any of his wealth at all, since it wouldn't do that much good anyway. And this is the philanthropic industrial complex come full circle. Capitalism impoverishes its workers, thus creating a need for social spending. But capitalists don't want the government to tax them as part of a redistributive system. So instead, capitalists argue that philanthropy should be used as the solution to our problems, which makes the payments from capitalists towards social spending completely voluntary. Now we have various problems on our hands, but neither the government nor the nonprofit sector have the resources to effectively combat them. So finally, capitalists point to the inability of a hamstrung government and public sector to fix these societal ailments as a reason why they shouldn't even have to make voluntary payments. Do you see the game here? It is literally just an argument to allow a few people to capture all of society's wealth and decision-making power, but with some extra steps so it doesn't seem too obvious. The fact that money is vacuumed out of communities into billionaires' bank accounts, leaving families with little income and poorly funded local governments, is exactly why it's hard to give away money effectively. A lack of consistent funding is the reason why communities lack proper infrastructure and well-designed social programs, so that when philanthropic funding does become available, it comes with high startup costs. This means more money is required to go towards less proven programs in order to achieve the same results when compared to simply paying workers in the first place. All of this is terribly ineffective and inefficient, and that's precisely the point. The nonprofit industry is not built with cost effectiveness or results for the less fortunate in mind. It is all just an appendage of a capitalist system which is built for one thing and one thing only to maximize wealth for the ruling class. Systemic change would do infinitely more for realizing positive social progress, but it's difficult to do and crucially would cut into the bottom lines of the rich and powerful. So rather than invest in addressing the root causes of poverty, pestilence, and environmental devastation, we instead spend a fraction of the cost to slap band-aids on top of everything. The philanthropic system, something we created to provide for society's least fortunate, has been hijacked by the ruling class as a cost-effective way of placating the masses. But rather than driving progressive change, philanthropy has become a lifestyle activity of the self-congratulatory elite. Lavish events and massive public relations campaigns overshadow the systemic failure to uphold our duties as global citizens. And because of philanthropy's high regard as a virtue within our society, it has been largely effective as a tool for weaponizing our altruism. Truly kind and wonderful people fill out the bureaucracies of the public sector. There is no shortage of generous people donating a couple of bucks wherever they can to try to make a positive difference. But no matter how much respect and appreciation we may have for those working toward a better future, we must acknowledge that this is not enough. We are altogether failing to create a better world than the one we have found. This is not to criticize those dedicating their lives to righteous causes. This is not about a moral failure from any given one of us. This is a systemic failure of capitalism and of society that must be addressed. For too long, capitalists have given one reason or another about why better things aren't possible. They will deny there is a problem, downplay the severity, admit that it's an issue but nothing can be done about it, and even set up a puppet philanthropic system before they pay their workers a fair wage, pay their fair share of taxes, reduce their pollution, or accept regulations on their business practices. And all of this is just to drive short-term profits at the expense of the long-term stability of our planet. And so if you are one of my nonprofit peers, or perhaps a liberal conscious capitalist type, and you sincerely want to make the world a better place, you need to reconsider your model. Reconsider whether a profit-driven system can really account for humanity in its spreadsheets. If you want a better world for your children, you may need to reconsider whether capitalism should still be assumed as a given. Because our capitalist system will prey on your financial instability, it will prey on your political insecurities, it will prey on your social divisions, and it will even prey on the part of you that desperately wants to make the world a better place. This is the cancer, and band-aids aren't going to do it. It must be cut out. <laughs>